Hi, everyone. I'm Antoine. I'm the co-founder of MindKeeper, a cybersecurity company based in Beirut. And I'm here today to give you an intro on blockchain, on crypto, cryptography, and blockchain. And if you have enough time, we'll dive into programming smart contracts for it. So, a little bit of background about myself. Um, so, I'm a cyber security engineer with data loss prevention. Now, I moved to cryptography like three years ago and we started with MIT, our company. Our product, MIT Password Manager and Authenticator, is a decentralized offline password manager and authenticator. So, basically, it's an app that allows you to manage passwords, notes, credit cards, government IDs in an offline manner and to sync the data in a decentralized way to other devices that you have without using the cloud, so that you stay secure in case hackers get into our servers or anything. So I got into blockchain in um, late 2013 when we started uh, thinking, like we, we started noticing the trend of uh, blockchain moving towards identity. Identity is a big problem today. It's a big problem in Lebanon. It's a very big problem in the US. And it's a problem because uh, we rely on static things to, ident to, to identify us. So for example, if I'm in uh, Lebanon, the, my passport number is my identity. If I use it, then I use part attributes that are key to my identity, and someone can start to impersonate me. In the US, your social security number lets you do a lot of things if you use it. If you lose it, then you lose a big chunk of your identity. So blockchain showed a lot of promise, shows a lot of promise in solving the identity problem, mainly because of the fact that it's a distributed technology, which means that it's not centralized, it's not controlled by a single um, uh, body. So decentralized identity is a very big deal now in the world, and we're part of it by partnering up with companies that are building decentralized protocols. So what we do is we provide the user interfaces, so mainly the app, which is my key, which is the app that allows you to manage your identity attributes, and we talk to these identity protocols in the back end in order to, be, in order to allow you to use this identity in different sorts of places. If it's a lot of Chinese, I, mean, I hope that towards the end of the lecture, it will be clear. So, um, blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, like what's the difference between all of them? This does this, this does that. How do you know the difference? How can you understand what this does if you don't know what blockchain is? I hope that I'll be able to answer these questions uh, today. So, uh, does anyone know how Bitcoin works? Like, on a technical level? Uh, do you So there's a the concept of network, a network or a decentralized body that uh, helps uh, validate transactions that become part of a permanent tracker, which is the blockchain. So before I can dive into what Bitcoin is and what blockchain technology is and what between blockchain and peer to peer and like blockchain and databases in general, is, I need to give you an intro about uh, cryptography because cryptography is the core of uh, blockchain and without it. You could understand the concepts, but you wouldn't grasp them. So cryptography is a means, it's, it's a way of people to communicate over an insecure medium in a way that only they know what they're talking about. So for example, if I want to talk to you right now, the air around us, which helps my voice come to you, is an insecure medium because anyone can listen to it. Because I'm speaking to you in a non-encrypted way, anyone that speaks uh, English right now can understand what you're saying. Encryption or cryptography is this layer that you build on top of our communication system in order to allow us to talk securely without anyone understanding what you're talking about. And that's a very old concept, started around the ages of Caesar and, uh, and, uh, and the Romans, where they needed to send pigeons, and these pigeons used to be intercepted and to, to prevent the pigeons from being intercepted and the messages from being uh, exposed. They used create different sorts of algorithms that made decoding the message a more difficult thing. So these systems were efficient at the time. Like if you were a cryptographer and knew uh, how to read them, you could figure out the way given enough time. Uh, 
but now with the advent of computer systems and uh, the speed at which we can process today, these systems break completely in a matter of a milliseconds. So uh, we have to create stronger systems that are more resilient to computer processing power. And uh, like this is what modern, modern cryptography is all about. So I'm going to talk specifically about encryption. Uh, which will help us get into blockchain in the second part of the of the, of the, of the uh, So there's three types of encryption. There's symmetric key encryption, symmetric. There's asymmetric, and there's something called hashing. So asymmetric and hashing is what's mainly used in blockchain. And symmetric is used a lot, and uh, this is, I think, one of the models that you might be familiar with. So let's say there's Alice and Bob, and Alice needs to send a message to Bob. Uh, usually, like, she sends the message over this insecure medium, and anyone listening into this medium can read the message. In order to prevent that from happening, what Alice and Bob do is they agree on a key, which is basically a string of characters that only they know. And this key is used to encrypt the message that's sent to Bob, and Bob uses the same key to decrypt the message. So Alice wants to say hi to Bob. Alice encrypts hi with this key and sends it to Bob. If someone looks at the medium here and doesn't know the key, the message looks like garbage. They cannot read what's going from Alice to Bob's endpoint. Whenever Bob receives the message, he uses, he uses the key to decrypt the encrypted message, which gets them back, gets, gets them back to the message of, uh, of Alice, initial message. So if, we, if Alice and Bob are able to agree on a shared key that only they know and only they will ever know, then they have a way to securely communicate over an insecure medium such as the internet. So Alice uses the key to encrypt the message and send it to Bob. Use, Bob uses the key to decrypt the message and read. If Bob wants to answer Alice back, he uses the same key to encrypt the next message and Alice uses the same key to decrypt the message. So this is great if you're able to share this message. Now let's say Alice is in Beirut and Bob is in New York. There's a huge challenge, which is how do you share this key in a secure way? There are many ways to do it. There are algorithms that allow you to do it in a way where you can send details across the insecure medium to agree on a message. But like the traditional way would be to send half of the message via the internet, the chat message, and the other half via the US postal office. It all depends on what type of attackers you're trying to prevent from getting into your thing. So if you're trying to prevent hackers in Russia, for example, from intercepting the message, this might be good enough because the internet might be insecure, but the US Postal Office is good because it doesn't pass by Russia. But if you're trying to protect yourself from the US government, for example, then this doesn't work anymore because they have control of both. So you need other ways to do it. So, uh, you need to adapt the key sharing mechanism in a way that, uh, that, that, that that protects you from your attack. So this is the first type of encryption. Uh, one of the algorithms that's very like used, that is the standard today, is AES 56, I would say. So this is still military grade. So if you're using it over very uh, very critical channels, AES 56 is a great algorithm. The advantages of this algorithm and this mode of, of encryption in general is that it's extremely fast. So you can encrypt and decrypt data very fast. You can implement the algorithms and hardware so you can speed it up very fast. The disadvantages are that you need to be able to share this key security. And very important is that if this key is lost at any point in time, if it's stolen at any point in time, then a hacker can go back in time and read all the message history that went between these two parties. So that's symmetric encryption. The second mode, which is used in blockchain, which is the core of blockchain actually, and the core of digital identity, is asymmetric. And in this scenario, there's Alice and then there's, there's both. But instead of having one key that they share and that they use to encrypt and decrypt the messages, both of them have two keys, a private key and a public key. The private key is a randomly generated string that's relatively long, could be 246 characters long, 56 characters long, and no one should ever see this apart from Alice. So Alice's private key is only known by Alice and it should never be seen by anyone. Bob's private key is generated by Bob and should only be known by Bob. It isn't like here where you send the, private, the, the key to the other party in order to encrypt and decrypt the message. You have to keep it to yourself. <coughs> From this private key, you can generate the public key. So a public key is like 
well, what it is. It's a public key, it's like your username. It's something that's made public that you need to give to someone whenever you need to send them a message or whenever you're expecting to receive whenever you're expecting to receive a message. So and the nice property about this mode of encryption is that let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob. The first thing that Alice does is she gets the public key of Bob. So now Alice has the public key of Bob. Step two is Alice encrypts the message with Bob's public key. So step one, she gets Bob's public key. Step two, she encrypts the message using Bob's public key and sends it over the, uh, the insecure medium, the internet. Now Bob receives the message, and the only <coughs> way to decrypt the message is with Bob's private key. So you use different keys to encrypt and, and decrypt the message. If you want to send the message to someone, you encrypt the message with their public key, which is public, it's like their username, it should be known. And if you're the person that wants to decrypt the message, you use your private key to decrypt the message. And assuming that this private key is stored in a secure manner, offline, away from prying eyes, you're almost always safely safe uh, from, from the key being stolen and the medium becoming insecure again. So, uh, and this is the type of encryption that's used around, uh, around blockchain. It's a variant of this, I'll come back to it in a bit. The third type of encryption, so the first type is symmetric encryption. There's a pre-shared key between Alice and Bob, both know the key. The same key is used to encrypt the message and decrypt the message. The good thing about this is it's extremely fast and simple. The bad thing about it is you need to protect this private key at any point in time. And if it's not compromised at any point in time, then uh, all of your message history gets compromised. Uh, I know algorithm is AES256. The second type is asymmetric encryption. In this mode of encryption, every user has two keys, a private key and a public key. A, a private key and a public key. The public key is generated from this private key. Everyone has a private key and anyone has a public key. To encrypt a message and send it to someone, you first need to get the person's public key. You encrypt the message with the public key and the recipient decrypts the message using their private key. So assuming that this private key is never compromised, your, 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 your medium is, is, is secure. And that's the key of, that's the key to digital identity, this private key. So in the real world, your DNA, who you are, the way you talk, the way you speak, is your proof of your digital identity, of your identity. In the digital realm, the best representation of digital identity today is this private key. Because it's something that's generated by you, and kept by you, and secured by you, and no one should see it except from you. So, so a good, like a known algorithm is here is RSA, a very RSA twenty forty, and these numbers are the key length. How long is the key? So, for example, RSA forty ninety six is a stronger algorithm than RSA twenty forty eight. The disadvantage of having a stronger algorithm is that it's slower to compute. So, if you're running on a low performance system or systems that cannot support this load, um, then you move back off. So RSA twenty forty eight is now the standard. Uh, RSA 1024 is now considered insecure, like on the verge of becoming really Yeah, of course. Like the data size is wide. No, but like with RSA, you can only encrypt 2048 bits. If you want to encrypt more, then you do a combination of these two, or you encrypt with the ES and encrypt the key. So, third type is hashing, and this is used everywhere. It's not used only in, in systems that use encryption, but it's used in systems that do a lot of things. Like most of the systems that you use online now, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, use a form of hashing. And hashing is basically, it's a trapdoor function where you start with a message by, you take it through an algorithm, so it does something, and it gives you a fixed size of, so for example, an algorithm for hashing is, is uh, so any message that you hash gives you a 256 bit hash at the end. So if I'm if I'm hashing a book or if I'm hashing the word high, I get a 256 bit message at the end. And the nice thing about it is if I hash high continuously, I'll get repeatedly the same output. So uh, let's say I have a book, a huge book, and I hash it. I get a 256 bit string. Then I delete this book and I put it on a server online. Someone downloads this book a year later and wants to make sure that it's still the same book that is not unchanged from the book that was initially created. If the author of the book has created the hash, then the new, the new, like the potential reader of the book can download the book and then hash it and it should give the same hash that was received a year back when the author first created the book. So this ensures integrity and it's used everywhere. Apart from like this use case, you could use it to uh, it's used for authentication for, for, for 
for example, whenever you're logging into Facebook, you type your username and password. Your password isn't sent to the server and compared with the password to the server. What, 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 what Facebook does is they take the password, they hash it, um, they hash it, and then they send it to the server. And their server stores a hash of the password. The server doesn't store the actual password. So the server stores the hash, the server checks to see if these two hashes match. If the two hashes match, the server gives you a session and logs it. So uh, the advantage of this, like the main advantage of this, is that whenever Facebook gets compromised at any point in time, hackers get hashed password and they don't get clear text password because we know how people are, how bad people are at managing their passwords. So we tend to use the same passwords or reuse the same like both variations of the same passwords everywhere. So having, having a hashing system that's properly done can protect, protect you up to a certain point from the from the server. Excuse me. Yeah, like hashing results. So which is a variant of this that doesn't give the same output every time that you that you hash something. So hashing is very important because it allows you to verify the integrity of something and it allows you to verify uh, certain elements without sharing the data per se. Uh, and this is very much used in blockchain in general. Now, going back to asymmetric encryption, we talked about how Alice could encrypt a message and send it to a pub. A very important property of asymmetric encryption is the ability to be able to generate digital signatures. A digital signature is basically the way for you to sign a file, uh, a series of characters or whatever. And anyone who knows your public key can do an operation and make sure that this file has been signed by you and was emanated from you. So this ensures that the message is coming from you. So encryption hides the message from external parties. Signatures allow you to sign a message and make sure and, and allow the recipient to validate the authentic, not authenticity, the the source, the source of the of the message. So and and this works very similarly to this. Instead of instead of encrypting the message that I want to send to Bob with his public key, the way we used to do before, you take the message and encrypt it using your private key, which is something you never do usually. It gives you a type of, uh, of a, a, a string, like an encrypted uh, string that you send to Bob. Then Bob can use your public key to decrypt the message. So for encryption. You use Bob's public key to encrypt the message. For signature, you use your own private key to encrypt or like sign the message that you're sending to Bob. So Bob usually decrypts the message with his private key, but if it's a signature, he ver verifies the signature with your public key. So it's, it's as if you switched the model. So encryption gives you like security over the medium, like confidentiality. Signature gives you integrity, integrity. So it's two different properties. And signatures are the core of like blockchain in general, signatures and hashing. Symmetric encryption is not used a lot unless it's a top-up application that works on top of a blockchain system, but it's not core to blockchain at all. Even encryption, uh, uh, asymmetric encryption is not used in Bitcoin, for example. What's used is digital signatures and hashing. And this is like the most important thing and what will let us like move into Bitcoin right now, like into blockchain right now. Do you have any questions? Okay. Now, uh, blockchain. Yeah. Uh, the in uh, blockchain solution, can you, uh, can you use only one type of description, but you know, hashing for uh, um, Like hashing is not a link. It's not a. It's not. It's, it serves different purposes. So hashing is made to ensure that something that I sent you uh, is integral. It hasn't been tampered with. Encryption is more like asymmetric encryption that I talked about here. is more about sending you a message in a way that no one can see it. So if I hash a message and send it to you, I send the message along with its hash, so anyone can read the message. If I want to hide the contents of the message, then I use asymmetric encryption. Different, uh, but close in the way they work. Really close. Okay, so blockchain. Uh, and as, so Bitcoin, blockchain, blockchain, Bitcoin was the difference. So blockchain is a technology that was created and basically solves a problem that used to be a very big problem uh, in the past and it's, the, it's called the Byzantine generals problem. And the idea is you have a town and you have a series of generals around the town. And these generals uh, are, uh, work for the same army, like they're part of the same army. And they want to attack the town, town and agree on a good time and methodology of attacking this town. And they don't have the internet like we're at, uh, like in the Bronze Age or whatever. And uh, they need to be 
able to securely communicate with each other in order to agree on a, on a, on a, on a way to attack the scam. So pigeons or messengers are the way to go, but pigeons can be intercepted, messengers can be intercepted, messengers could be malicious, one of the generals could be malicious, a sixth general could be part of the, of, the, of the gang, and this is like a hidden general who is trying to manipulate the system. So it was a very difficult problem in the past. And uh, what blockchain solves via proof of work, which is the, 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 the consensus algorithm, so the algorithm that allows these generals to be in consensus, to agree on a way to do something, uh, was first like revealed by uh, by uh, the Satoshi Nakamoto paper in 2009, I guess. Uh, so, what is the blockchain in general? Actually, what is Bitcoin in general? Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is this, a way to exchange uh, value between people, a way that's decentralized and a way where uh, it's a network of people that are independent or can be independent from each other that validate these transactions that are going through the network. And these like these nodes on the network allow you to, like can can be self-sustaining and can validate the transactions that are going through the network in a way that doesn't require anyone else on the system to be to help them to do it. So if you're a node in a blockchain network or in the Bitcoin network for example, you're able to validate all the transactions that are going through the system in a way that gives you assurances that all the transactions that have been added to any sort of ledger or block are valid. So that's blockchain. So that's Bitcoin in general. So the way that Bitcoin works is as follows: you have the concept of blocks, and blocks are basically ledgers that that, that are that have three parts: a header, a body, and a footer. The body contains transactions. So if I'm sending you money, this transaction will appear in one of the blocks in the body section of the block, and these are the blocks that constitute the chain that's from where the name comes from, like blockchain. So the way that it works is, I want to send you money today. I create a transaction. Transaction. This transaction has two things. It has inputs and it has outputs. Inputs is what I put in to send you. And outputs is what you can spend later on. So, as you can see, that's like that's an atomic transaction, and there's no other way for me to create bitcoins unless I'm a miner. So any money that I spend is money that I should have received from a previous transaction. So in the input section, you can have one input, or you can have multiple inputs. And in the output section, you can have one output, or you can have multiple outputs. What's important is that the unspent output that you add as an input, this part, is cannot be split. It's atomic. So if I have two bitcoins in a in a in an unspent output, and when I send it to you, I want to send you one bitcoin. What I do is create a transaction that takes as an input these two bitcoins, and as an output takes two things: a one bitcoin output that goes to you, and a one bitcoin output that goes back to myself. Okay, so this is how like information flows across the system. Whenever this transaction is created, I submit it to the network. And the network is basically computers that have decided to store a full copy of the blockchain, a full copy of these blocks, and have decided to validate these blocks. So whenever this is received by a miner, he adds it to a pool, which is called a temporary pool of transactions. Basically, transactions that are not verified yet. Whenever he wants to mine a block, and this happens with Bitcoin every 10 minutes, the miner picks a handful of transactions from the uh, from the memory pool, so the, the, the unverified transactions, verifies them, and he, and he verifies them by making sure that this unspent output wasn't used in a previous block, that this unspent output is actually valid, that the parameters in the, in the transactions are valid. So there's a series of consensus uh, rules that he needs to, to check to make sure that the transaction is valid. And when he's sure that it's valid, he adds it to the block that he's currently mining. So he's creating a block right now, and he's adding transactions, verifying, adding, verifying, adding, verifying, adding, verifying, adding. And it's very important for him to make sure, the miner, to make sure that this transaction is actually valid. Because if one of the transactions in his block, or the block that he's mining, and might potentially mine before anyone else, is, uh, is invalid, this block is rejected, and all the time that he spent mining the block is, is lost. So the miner is incentivized to make sure that uh, this transaction is valid, and all the transactions are valid, and the information in the block, the handler, and everything else 
is valid. So the miner receives these, he puts them in memory bin. Every 10 minutes when a new block is mined, he wants to start, he wants to start competing on mining the next block. And I get to mining in a bit. But he needs to solve a puzzle really fast whenever a previous block is mined in order to receive a reward. So what he does is he takes transactions from the memory pool, he fills up his, uh, his, uh, his block, the potential block that he's mining, uh, he validates the transaction, and then he starts mining. And here everyone's competing, all the miners around the globe are competing on mining the next block, and it will take them around 10 minutes to mine the next block. The first person to mine the blocks, the block, uh, broadcasts this uh, to the other miners, or to the miners that he's connected to, and, that, and they do the same in a gossip way, in a gossip sort of way. And all the miners verify that the transaction, the block in general is valid, and if everyone is satisfied, or whenever a miner is sat uh, a node is satisfied, the node adds the block to the permanent chain, and everyone starts mining the next block. So uh, there's a race every 10 minutes that starts, and the race is between miners. Miners are people that take transactions, add them to a sort of entity which is a block or a ledger, and they start mining this ledger, doing computations on this ledger, until they find the puzzle. It will take them approximately 10 minutes by design to find the solution to the puzzle. Whenever one of the miners finds the solution to the puzzle, the, mi the miner takes this block and broadcasts it to the network, telling the network that, okay, I found the solution, this is the solution, I'll take the reward, let's start mining the next block. The entire network validates this, and they are incentivized to try to find mistakes in it, because if another miner finds a mistake in a mined block, then he can reject this block and potentially like provide his own block, which gives them the reward. Um, so if everyone is satisfied, then the block is added to the chain and everything continues. There's cases where uh, two miners within a couple of minutes mine two blocks that are valid at the same time. These blocks generally contain different transactions, but two miners found valid solution to, solutions to the block. So this miner, let's say this miner is in, uh, is in China, and this miner is in, the, is in France. The miner in China starts propagating this block to all the nodes that are around him. So it will take a lot of time to get to the node in France. And the node in France starts propagating the new block that he mined to the nodes around him. So it will take a lot of time to get to China. So, so all the nodes that are between France and China start receiving uh, different, uh, different versions of the block at different points in time that are both valid. So what happens in this case is that the, the entire chain forks. <coughs> so there's a fork here where you have two, two, two chains that are created. The chain that will continue from the guy that mined the block in China and a chain that will start uh, and that's initiated by the guy who's in France. So that's France, that's China. And how do we go back to a state where there's one chain? Well, this happens when the next block is mined. So half of the miners in the world, let's say half got this message and half got this message, half of the miners will start mining the next block based on this block, and half of the miners will start mining the next block based on this block. <coughs> let's say that this guy, uh, the miner here, finds a block uh, one minute before a miner here, then this guy propagates the information to the entire network, the entire network receives it, even the guys in France, and they say, okay, this branch was able to mine the next block faster than this branch, so this branch is now discredited. The transactions that are part of this uh, branch go back to the memory pool, the unvalidated transactions, and we continue from here. Now, the problem with this is that if you bought a car here, if someone bought a car from you here, uh, 10 minutes later, the transaction that you thought was valid and the guy that is out the door with the car is now invalid. So the person is, is as if the person hasn't sent you the money because even if the <coughs> transaction goes back to the memory pool, if the other person like uh, spends the same output somewhere else, then whenever this goes back to the mining uh, mining block, the mining block will go, either go back as invalid or the or it will pass. So, there's, there's a good chance that, that, that your transactions will go invalidated. That's why uh, it's, it's always best advice to wait uh, six blocks if you're, if you're sending a substantial amount of, uh, of funds between uh, to, to a certain party. If it's a small amount, like if you're buying coffee or whatever, one block is usually enough, two blocks is usually enough because like, it will make sense to, work, to wait any longer. So we've talked about how these blocks are created every 10 minutes. And these blocks are mined by a miner and appended to the to the light, like to the, to the previous uh, the previous mined block. But we haven't discussed how this link actually happens. 
So what happens is this, the hashing part. Whenever I add transactions to a block that I'm mining, what I do is I take all these transactions along with other information and I hash them. And this hash gives me a hash, a 256-bit hash, or in the, case of, in the case of Bitcoin, 160 bits, a bit hash. And I add this hash to the top of, uh, of my, uh, to in the header of my, of, of my block. So here I have a hash that's basically a hash of all the transactions that are in my block. So if any of these transactions are changed, this hash changes considerably. So it becomes something else completely. And it allows someone that who's looking at this hash to know that there's something that, change, that has changed in this block and to reject it. So let's say I have a block with five transactions. What the miner does is he creates the hash of, of these five transactions and puts it at the top of the block. If at any, and then he sends it to the network. If at any point in time someone changes one of these transactions in his database, and, and another person comes to verify a block, then the person takes these transactions and hashes them, and this transaction is changed. So the new hash that he gets is different from the hash that's written at the top of the header, which allows him to know that something has been changed in this, in this block. So he invalidated and know that there's something up and disconnect from the network and try to reconnect to other nodes. So something has been tampered with. But it doesn't happen this way exactly. It happens in a different way where uh, this, the next node contains a hash of the previous node. So it's like a chain. So if I'm mining a block, the next block that I mine has to contain the hash of the previous block that was mined. Okay? So if something changes here, whenever I'm going back to, to verify the validity of blocks, I take this hash with me, I go back to this block, I do the hashing part, I check the hash, and I get different hashes. If I get different hashes, it means that at this point, there was a change to the data in the blockchain, and the data is now considered invalid, and I need to find a way to sync again. And I sync again by disconnecting and reconnecting to other nodes in the network that might have a better version of the, of the, of the blockchain. So, um, so this, like, this hash verifies the integrity of blocks, so I verify that this block is, is the, it came after this block and that this block came after this block. And as a blockchain node, what I do to validate the blockchain, whenever I start becoming a node, I need to download the entire blockchain. I need to get it into my database. And the blockchain is basically this. And the way that I do, the first thing that I do is I make sure that all the blocks are valid and I go back from the greatest height. So height is the latest blockchain. Like the height of the blockchain is the latest block that was mine. I start validating these transactions. If I'm okay with it, I take this hash, I move to this. I hash these, I make sure the hash is the same. If the transactions are valid, I go back. And I go back until reaching the Genesis block, which is the block that was initiated by Satoshi Nakamoto. This is the first block that was in the, in the blockchain network, and the Bitcoin network. If I, so if I go back and I can get to it in a way where I'm, I'm satisfied, the hashes are satisfied, the transactions seem okay, then the blockchain that I have is actually valid, and I can start building on top of it with new things. If I get any sort of uncertainty in time, I just put a line where I found the uncertainty and then try to get the different the version of the blockchain from someone else. So this is how like blocks are validated. Now in terms of transactions inside the block, uh, these transactions are, let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six transactions in the block. There's a hash called the Merkle root that's created. And this basically is the following. You take these first two transactions, you hash them. You take these other two, you hash them. And you take these two, you hash them. You then hash these two and hash these two and you end up with a, hash, a master hash here. And this hash is the Merkle root of the block and that's basically the hash that gets sent back in time. And this serves two purposes. One, it allows us to make sure that this block came after the block that came before it. So uh, I can link the blocks together in a cryptographically tight way and have undeniable proof that this is the version of the, of the blockchain that's actually the valid one. That's purpose number one. And the second purpose is it allows us to be able to verify transactions. So us as users, as end users, we have mobile apps, we have computer apps, we have tablet apps, and different sorts of apps that allow us to to, to communicate with the blockchain. But as apps, we cannot hold a full copy of the blockchain and maintain it because it, it requires a constantly connected uh, node on the internet. 
that needs uh, a lot of storage space and a lot of computation power, or a fair amount of computation power. So as mobile phone users and whatever, we don't, we don't hold this data. What we do is we keep a copy of all the headers that are in the blockchain, okay? So as it, let, me, let me go back. Let's say you're using the Coinbase app to buy Bitcoin. You have, an, you have a phone, phone app with Coinbase on it, and there's the server of Coinbase that's in the cloud. And this server contains a full <coughs> node, a full Bitcoin node, for example. And this node is connected to other nodes that are around the internet. So it's a decentralized system for Bitcoin. But for me, as a user, it's a centralized system because I'm talking to a single server. So I depend on this server. If Coinbase was to go down, my service was to go down, or it was, uh, has to go down. If uh, Coinbase has latency issues, I have latency issues. If uh, Coinbase is having trouble validating, tra validating transactions, I'm having trouble validating transactions. So I depend a lot on Coinbase. So it's a decentralized system in general between the different nodes. But for me, as a, as a client working with a service provider, it looks as if it's a centralized system because it's a regular client-server architecture. Now, uh, what I do to make sure that I'm, that, that I'm secure is I hold a copy of all the headers that were in the blockchain. So the headers aren't very expensive to store uh, from a storage point of view. So I keep all of these headers with me. I don't store the bodies or the footers or whatever, which is very expensive in terms of storage and computations. So I keep all the headers with me, and I can make sure that the headers are actually valid by making sure that every hash uh, in the header points to the hash of a previous block. This is how I know the blocks are valid. Now let's say I send you 10 bitcoins. Uh, how do I make sure that the, actually, the transaction actually passed? I cannot rely, I could rely on Coinbase to tell me that it passed, okay, good, you should just continue working. And this is what you do today. So you send a request to Visa, you get a request back saying that your transaction passed and it's good enough for you. But it shouldn't be good enough for you because you need to be able to assess, make your own assessment as to uh, the validity of the transaction that you emitted. So you keep these headers with you and these headers contain the Merkle root, which is this hash. Let's say you have this transaction that's in the block. What you tell Coinbase is, you tell Coinbase, okay, you told me that my transaction is in this block, but I don't trust you. I have my hash, this is my transaction, send me something called a Merkle path. And what a Merkle path is, is it's, it's let me remove this to make it easier. So what a Merkle path is, it's a series of steps that Coinbase can provide me that allow me to make sure that I actually have a valid transaction. So I tell Coinbase, okay, you told me that the transaction is valid, I need to validate it. This is my hash. And what Coinbase does is it takes this, one, and it takes this, two. It adds them together and sends them to me. And what I do is, I have this hash, I use the first thing that it gave me to hash it. I receive this hash. Coinbase also gave me this hash, so I can hash these two, and I receive this hash. <coughs> And this is the Merkle root of the, of, the, of the block which is in the header. So if I end up, if this ends up being the header of the block that I'm in, then it means that I was able to validate that my transaction was part of this block without having to store the, <coughs> a big copy of the block. And this is not a new concept. The new, the, the, this concept is all it's used in Git, for example, uh, like everywhere by hundreds of thousands of developers. So, um, as a light node, a light node is basically a client or an app that's not holding a full copy of the blockchain and that's not validating. But it's, so it's not a full node that holds the, the copy of the entire blockchain and validates transaction. And it's not a miner, which is a full node that also mines a block. It's a light node. What a light node is, it's just basically just a node that keeps track of the headers and that's able to verify in real time that a transaction is in, is in, a, specific, uh, is in a specific block that was mined. And the light node has to rely on a full node to give it the information. So there's different ways to secure this communication in order to hide what transactions are emitted by you from external parties. We won't get this. So let's take three steps back. Um, so blockchain. There's the concept of blocks. Blocks contain transactions and headers. The transactions are basically the transactions that we exchange with each other. A block contains many transactions. A header contains a hash that links to a previous block. And this hash, if it, satisfi if it satisfies the hashing of the previous block, gives us uh, like we're, uh, gives us proof that this block came after this block, and both blocks are valid. As a as a full node, what I do is keep track, keep this entire thing with me, and I make sure that every new block that I receive is valid before appending it to my blockchain. As a light node, so as a user of a certain technology, I have to rely on a full node 
to give me Merkle's files to ensure that a transaction was in a specific block, and I have to rely on a full node to give me information about the state of the blockchain. So any uh, new block header get, that gets added, any fork that happens need to be relayed to me by the full node. The good thing here is that apps could connect to different endpoints. So if, for example, uh, Coinbase is a US-based uh, service, we don't trust the Americans for any reason, then you could connect to a different full node that's uh, based in uh, Ireland, for example, that gives you some sort of protection when it comes to the storage of the data. It's not really valid, but the point is that you're able, like by design, you're able to connect to different sorts of, of servers that maintain a copy of the ledger. You're not bound to one single instance of it. And that's the main difference between a client-server approach, which was a traditional way of doing things, where you rely on a specific entity or body to give you information about the state of your like, affairs, and blockchain, where you actually have different nodes, and these nodes all work together in maintaining the status of the system, following a very set, specific set of consensus rules. Uh, so <coughs> that's it. Now the, mo the, the innovation here is the mining. So the mining is what's new. All of this could have been, has been implemented in the past. You could create chains. You could make sure that transactions were signed, uh, encrypted. You could validate. Uh, you could create a Merkle tree, a Merkle path, whatever. Proof of uh, proof of work. The consensus algorithm is the new thing. And I'll give you. Uh, an idea of how it works. It's actually really simple when it comes to Bitcoin. So the idea is that every 10 minutes a block needs to be created. For this block to be to be created, for this block to be mined, a series of nodes on the network needs need to do a series of computation or compete on these computations. And the first person to get to a result, a result that everyone can agree on, is the person who receives the block reward and has his block appended to the blockchain. And uh, the idea is the following. You have the Merkle root hash, the, the hash, I'm calling it the hash, the Merkle root hash here. That's the hash that's created from all the transactions within the block, and that's the hash that links back to, that, that's linked back to from future blocks and whatever. What, and we said that hashing something gives you a random series of uh, characters. And if you change a single thing in the hash, then this changes completely. So if I have high, Let's say it gives me A, A, B, C. If I have high with two I's, I get something completely different, B, A, dollar, nine. So uh, what I do here is we agree on a, so this hash is a basically a number. It's a huge number, okay? We say that, okay, let's start with this hash and let's append to it something called a nonce or prepend to it something called a nonce. A nonce is basically a number that starts with 32 zeros, for example, okay? What the miner does is he signs this hash and gives him an output. And his goal is to get to an output or a number that's smaller than a specific target. So let's say that this is 256 bits. Let's say this is 32 characters. And the result needs to have four zeros at the beginning. So it needs to be smaller than a number that has four zeros and 28 different characters. So I take the hash and the nonce with zeros and I hash it. I receive a random output, no zeros. I increment this nonce, I do a plus one. So now it's zero, 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 one, and I hash it. The hash gives me a completely different result. Still, it doesn't give me four zeros. So I continue, two, three, four, five, six, and I end up doing millions, if not billions, of, of, uh, of iterations and hashing until I reach a hash with pure log that has like four zeros at the beginning. Or 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 satisfy or is smaller than the target. So all the network agrees on a target. The target needs to be smaller than a specific number. We know that this is 32 uh, digits. We agree that we need to have four zeros at the beginning. So it needs to be smaller than that. All the miners take the hash and start incrementing, uh, start hashing it by incrementing the nonce. So they hash, check, not smaller, increment two. Hash, check, not smaller, three, four, five, six, seven, millions, hundreds of millions of times until they reach the, the until they reach the result that they want. When they do reach the result that they want, their header, the header of the block, contains the root, Merkle root hash that we've been talking about, the nonce, 
which is the number that he got. So let's say 999992306 here. And infor additional information in the header and the transactions. And this is what's sent to the other nodes in the network. So as I know the network, I receive a potentially mined block. The first thing that I do is, okay, I take the nonce, I take the hash, I hash it, uh, I take the nonce, I, I take the worker root hash, I hash them, I should receive a hash that's smaller than the target. If this is correct, it means that the miner did his work in terms of computation of power. I can that then move on to verify the validity of the transactions in the, net, in the, in the block. I go to the transactions one by one and make sure that they are valid, that they are not unspent, that they are not badly formed, that the, the block size uh, is, uh, is valid, like it's not bigger or smaller than it should be, like bigger than it should be. If I'm satisfied about everything, I then commit this to my blockchain. So this is the new height of my blockchain. And everyone starts mining the next block based on this. So this is the like this is the innovation, the race to hash things until you get to a target that's uh, that, that's agreed upon by everyone. Now, I think the problem with with computation is that we follow Moore's law. So every two years, our computational power doubles. So this difficulty or this target needs to adapt with. The, with the hardware that, we, that the miners have. So I think every 2016 blocks, 2014, there's I think every 2014 mine blocks, the network reassesses uh, the, 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 the difficulty of the mining and a new difficulty is set by everyone. And this is done by looking at the 2014 previous blocks and uh, and they need to be mined within 10 minutes. So my target is to have this block um, mined at minute 10, this block mined at minute 20, this one at 30. Let's say this did it at 22, and this at 38. So this means that it's taking longer for the miners to mine the block, which means that the difficulty needs to be, uh, is too high. So it needs to be taken down a little bit. If on the other hand, I'm seeing that people are mining blocks every eight minutes instead of every 10 minutes, then the difficulty has to be increased in order to adapt to it. So this is done in a very simple way from a high level point of view. Is you have a number, which is the target, and the average mining time was, let's say, eight minutes. You need the, the, the average uh, mining time to be 10 minutes. You recalculate the target using like the <coughs> multiply these two and divide by this. So you get the new target, which is then agreed upon. And this is also the way that full nodes know uh, what the target is, because how can they agree on a target if it's a decentralized system? They would need another sort of mining protocol which creates like an endless loop. So the way that they validate it is they look at the, at the blockchain, which they know that it's valid because they validated it, and use the timing between the blocks and the, and the current difficulty to calculate the future difficulty. And this difficulty goes either up or down. And uh, this difficulty also gives you insight into what kind of players are joining the network. So if you're starting with a 9.5 minute mining time, and then within six blocks you see it drop to six minutes or to four minutes, you understand that there's a new computation power that joined the system, and there's new influences on the system. And what will happen here is that if it's technology that's not owned by, by anyone, if it's like, for example, top secret processing units uh, generated by the, the French government, uh, no one would have it, and they'll be the ones that are able to mine the blocks uh, in a sequential manner. So the system moves from a decentralized system back to a centralized system, but it's a short-term move from a decentralized to a centralized, because eventually other nodes will adapt their computational power to match this one, and uh, be able to compete again on mining the blocks. So what's in it for the miners? Like they're, compute they're, they're putting so much computational power, they're computing so much time, what do they get in return? They get two things. First of all, they get rewards from transactions. So initially we said that in a transaction there's two things, there's inputs and outputs. Let's say I'm sending you two bitcoins and I have an unspent an output of four bitcoins. What I do is I create an output of two bitcoins for you, but instead of sending the two back to me, I send 1.8 bitcoins back to me. And implicitly the miner knows that the difference between the outputs and the inputs is the tip that I give to the miner. And the miner likes to see tips because he prefers transactions that contain tips. So you could not tip and just give two back to you and just give the strict amount to the other person. But if the miner were to decide what transactions are added to the next block from the memory pool, he starts by picking the ones that have a lot of tips. So these are the ones that get mined the fastest, so within the next 10 minutes. 
and then uh, the one that tipped less gets mine later on. If you never if you never tip, there's a good chance that your that your block might be added to the to, that your transaction might be added to the block, but it will come later on. And now with the state of Bitcoin, it's very difficult for a, a transaction without tips to go on. So that's the first way for a miner to make money. The second way, which is today the main revenue stream of miners, is something called the Coinbase. A Coinbase is Bitcoin that the miner actually creates for himself whenever he mines a block. So a, bit, a Coinbase is actually an, un, an unspent output that the miner creates and adds to the block that he's currently mining. If the block turns out to be valid, the miner can then spend this unspent output a hundred blocks later. So this protects from different sorts of attacks uh, later on. So as a miner, I create a block. There's a header that contains the Merkle root, the nonce information, the nonce information, and different sorts of metadata. There's the body that contains the transactions, and there's also the nonce, the, uh, the coin base in the header, which is basically an unspent output that the miner can use 100 blocks in the future, 100 blocks in the future, the future if his block turns out to be valid. And uh, today the reward is 12.5 bitcoins, so it's a lot of money. Uh, with every every couple of every four years, I think the block reward is half. So we we'll reach uh, a time in the very near future, like where the block reward, uh, like the miner receives more rewards from the tips than he receives from the Coinbase, until eventually there is no reward for, uh, that's that, that's coming from the Coinbase at all. All the rewards are coming from within the tips that the miner receives, and the, like this will create some sort of like social political like political. Yeah. I've got a question. Yeah. On blockchain, when you speak of transactions, there is the Bitcoin, that's one part, but blockchain is also being used, let's say, for documents and whatever it yeah. is. How do they pay for that? Since it's not based on a Bitcoin or a transaction money. How do they pay for like documents? Yeah, if they mine for those documents, okay. how do they get rewarded for? It? Okay, so there, there's so there's different projects, right? Blockchain, uh, Bitcoin is the name of the protocol. It's the name of the currency. Like <coughs> Bitcoin is used mainly, mainly, mainly for money. You could use it for additional purposes, but it's not mean it's not designed for that. As the block time is 10 minutes, and you don't want the transaction that you do to to take 10 minutes to be validated. Other projects such as uh, Ethereum, IOTA, and different Ripple and different projects serve different purposes. The ones that do like that serve this general purpose computer thing where you can share files, validate uh, files, validate contracts, and do these things, uh, end up being uh, protocols that have a currency built in, a cryptocurrency built in. So in the case of Ethereum, you could Ethereum is basically a virtual computer that's shared across all the nodes in the system. And you can run code. By running code means you can do any sort of operation on a contract, right? But how do you incentivize the miner to do your thing? And how do you incentivize people to use it and make money out of it? In, it, in the case of Ethereum, there's a currency called the, the Ether that's, uh, that you append to every transaction that you want to send, every operation. And it gets paid the same way. So there's always an underlying uh, cryptocurrency whenever you're talking about like these general purpose or single purpose applications that are out of the currency world. Like, make sense? Yeah. Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, should we see us, uh, let's say, in 100 years that then, but to some level, no fees the miner be hida for 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 hashing, uh, let's say, or validating a transaction, but see a lot of the reward that be hida from the Yeah. What will happen then? What will incentivize uh, the, the, the miners you know, to validate transactions? In a, uh, Oh, oh she, this is like still 100, I think, years away. But uh, let's say that we reach that point, and the block size is still the same, and you can fit just the same amount of transaction. Then, uh, then, most probably the fees will go up. So the transaction fee will go up because the miner will be spending a lot of computation power and expect expect returns that they will actually expect returns that are profitable for him. So instead of having a small transaction fee that you send with every transaction that you create, this might increase uh, first. Uh, but more than that, I can tell you, it's actually something that's being studied right now. It's more of an economic problem than a, than a technology problem because it's mechanisms that are well known. Like when, when the, when the actual authority leaders can start controlling the transactions more because they're not incentivized by a higher reward that's generated by the system. Uh, in Ethereum, uh, the way that the difficulty is going up, it costs you more money to maintain a minor node than it does 
two years. I don't know if it's sustainable or not necessarily. What we know is the proof of work, which is the algorithm used, the consensus algorithm used now, is being criticized a lot now because it's very not environmental friendly. So it requires a lot of processing power, which emits green gases, and like, it's very wasteful. So there are alternative consensus mechanisms that are that are already in play, and others that are already being worked on, such as proof of stake, proof of burn, proof of time spent, and whatever, that find like find the solution to the Byzantine general problem in a way that's less wasteful. So for example, with proof of stake, which is what Ethereum will move to in the very near future with Casper, uh, has a different way of working. So as a miner, you say, okay, I'm, about, I'm going to lock 16 ethers in order to mine the next block. So I'm staking money in order to get the privilege to mine the next block. And another says, okay, I'll put 18, and there's a combined series of things that need to happen, but if I end up mining, being the person who's elected to mine the next block, I mine it and submit it to the network. If the block is fine, then I get back these 16 meters and the rewards from this. If the, if the block is not fine, as a punishment, I lose these, they're locked forever, and I don't get the reward from this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a way to keep them in check without having them compete based on processing power. Yeah, to be regulated by this, but uh, like here people are saying that okay, this solves long-term security solutions, like uh, security problems that arise after on the blocks are mined. But this creates problems because it centralizes the network even more because people that have more money end up being the ones that mine the next block. So there will be a transition period uh, until like you get uh, more. But even in Bitcoin today, like the, the idea of having decentralized miners that completely don't know each other and act according to their own uh, like economic uh, economic needs doesn't exist that much anymore because because of the fact that there are a lot of big powers such as like state sponsored uh, players uh, entering the, the mining uh, the mining uh, world uh, smaller miners had to, uh, to to start working together and create pools of mining pools and what a mining pools and what a mining pool is basically is we're 10 people that have computers. He's one person with a server. We, we, we take, we, we're able to compete with him by mining our efforts together. So we combine our computational power. This uh, complexity is reduced because we share it. And then we share the reward of the block. The reward of the, like coming from the, point, from the, from the mining of the block. And today, uh, there's four mining pools that control basically the Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin uh, realm in general. So it's not, you cannot say that it's a centralized system at the moment, but it's designed to be a centralized system and everything tends to normalize in the future. So this is, these are things that are yet to be like, observed and analyzed. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now what do you want to do? Okay, you, you want to set it in stone and make it more difficult? Okay, let, let me, let, I'll, I'll go a step back, which will answer your question and other. So all of this depends on identity. And this is like my area, I can, so I can tell you about it in a lot of detail, insurance not so much. But, uh, So today we have this concept of blocks. Everything that gets mined into a block is immutable. So it cannot be changed after it was added. And that's one of the best properties of blockchain. Okay? Let's say that uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're a client of an insurance company. So there's the insurance company. And there's the bank. And there's the hospital. One of the big, like, problems or the big like pain points of all these entities in general or these in general are KYC. So you need to be able to validate the identity of a user and be able to build a case for the user and add attributes to the user that create his like historical uh, like his portfolio. So uh, blockchain is basically actually very good for that. The way that it works is as follows. So I, I'm a user. user. That's my phone. With my phone, I take a picture of my passport, of my driver's license, of my insurance card, of my hospital card, of my bank account number. So all of this information is stored on my phone. 
and this is information that's only held by me. It's not verified. I could have tampered it with it if I give it to you and trust it. Uh, Photoshop is a really good tool these days. So this is stored here. I go to my bank to open a checking account. What they ask for, for is, for example, Walid uh, Mukhtar and uh, IT and Walid uh, Maash. And there's a person that validates it and sends it to the operations office that makes sure that uh, the document is valid, etc. And when they're satisfied, they give the check, uh, the, the go ahead, and your bank account is created. The problem with that is whenever you go to an insurance a hospital, for example, or another bank or a university, and they need to do this verification process. I mean, they have to do it uh, like they have to do it as if it hasn't been done in the past. So it's costly. So on average, it costs twenty-two dollars for a bank to open a basic checking account because of the KYC requirement. It takes time, and it's not efficient in general. And from a user point of view, my privacy and security is not made, is not ensured at all because my sensitive information is kept from <coughs> third parties, and if these third parties are compromised, then I lose my identity attributes, which are everything these days, because if someone has a set of documents that match my identity, they can use them to do identity fraud. Like, identity is very static today. So, with, with, this is how Bitcoin, or blockchain, Sorry, this is how blockchain solves our problem. I go to my bank, I want to open a basic checking account. They ask for my documents. I give them the documents they, the way I've, I've, I've done it in the, the past 100 years. They check them the same, the same way they've been checking them for the past 100 years. But the difference today is that they hash these documents. So my passport photo gives me a hash. My ID, Italia hash. My insurance card gives me a hash. And these hashes are signed by the bank. So the bank has a private key. And they sign and they sign the and they sign the, and commit them to the blockchain. They add them to one of the blocks. Yeah. And I go to my my insurance company. I want to start. Uh, I want to. I want to. I want to start having insurance. And there's a minimum set of requirements that are required from me in order to be insured. Instead of providing insurance with these documents, and the insurance company have to do the due diligence on these documents, the insurance company just looks at. I, I provide the company with the hashes of these documents, these hashes. The insurance company looks at the blockchain and verifies that the bank, a bank has verified these transactions. To the extent that the insurance company trusts this bank, the insurance company can trust the user. So if I can, I work with this bank. So if this insurance company works with this bank, and this bank has done the KYC on this user, then the insurance company can, on the spot, uh, provide insurance to the user if there's no external uh, processes needed to give insurance to the user. So uh, after that, the insurance when the insurance company is actually is actually uh, satisfied with the information, they provide me with my insurance information, the documents, the clauses, the different things that uh, apply to me. They hash these things and commit them to the blockchain as well. So now the blockchain contains different attributes that I have. They contain my bank, the information that was required for me to open a bank account, and the information that the insurance company provided me after I started getting insurance from this company. So this does two things. First of, you, first of all, it streamlines the process for insurance companies. So someone gets in on the spot, he can be processed. If someone goes into the same insurance company's uh, different, uh, offices, different offices or, or something else, they don't rely on servers that need to be maintained, that can go down and stop work, that can get hacked and manipulated, etc. They can re the insurance company can in real time validate that these are the the thing that were given to the specific user. And the user is safe because the sensitive data is not stored in the insurance company servers or the bank servers. It's only hashes that are not identified with information. Now let's say that the insurance, insurance company has this identity platform and it communicates with the rest of the network. So the insurance company can say, okay, I did the KYC on this user, and now I know that this user has this valid document, this valid document, and I gave him these two other valid documents. So these other two valid attributes can be used, for example, by a hospital. Instead of having to go through the process of getting paperwork, put paper pushing right and left, and validate like insurance fraud and different sort of things, what I can do is just put a price tag next to it, for example, one ether, and put it on the blockchain. Whenever this user gets to the hospital, the hospital checks the hash and knows that it's part of the blockchain. If they want to get the record, they can pay the insurance company immediately from, from using the blockchain's uh, built-in features to acquire a verified copy of the documents in exchange for <coughs> So it's a revenue stream for the person who's creating KYC and issuing this KYC on the, on the blockchain. It ensures the privacy out of the user and it streamlines the entire process and it makes it simpler and faster for, for the user.
charge you for example when you do those transactions it's very expensive today so for Mark example centralized. so for example <coughs> decentralized is it, is ethereum is centralized ethereum yeah no it's decentralized no, it's, it's owned by it's owned by a person 
Okay, so it's owned by a foundation called the Ethereum Foundation today. Yeah. But the system is designed to be decentralized and generated. But if they want to shut it down, they will shut down all the network. Yeah, and I'm not saying no. I'm saying Which that yes, yeah, there is. Today there is, but that's a short-term hurdle because we're they're still building the system and making sure that everything is deployed properly, given enough time and resources. If I'm a big insurance company and I'm going to about to do a two billion dollar bet on blockchain. I'm not going to rely on the Ethereum Foundation. What I do first is have enough node to be able to counter them and control the, the consensus protocol of the network. So, and others will do the same because my competitors will see into this and they'll do the same. And as soon as you have these socio-economic problems that start to arise, Bitcoin, the network becomes decentralized. So, so you think ICOs are a healthy... Uh... That's a completely different topic. ICOs are great, potentially, but like everything, they can be uh, over... Uh, they can be bad. To get to the point, how much would they charge you? You said it's expensive. Yeah. So for example, for an Ethereum today, if you were to do a transaction, it costs you up to $0.3 for a transaction. It's very expensive. Very, very expensive. But this will go down when we're in transition. It's a bit confused what about like $40 or $50. Bitcoin fees went up a lot when at the, at the peak of the hype in the past month. But because Bitcoin was never designed to be a scalable thing, a scalable protocol. Bitcoin was a proof of concept to show that this something that would work and it's still around because it has shown that it's extremely resilient and it's like the front facing entity for the entire crypto. But it is the only uh, currency today that gives the freedom that are, people are looking for, the freedom of uh, the market freedom, the economic freedom. Other currencies they are not, uh, they are shit coins. Uh, Oh. Why are she spoils? They are good points. That's not true. That's not true. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say that, but most of these are trapped in Bitcoin and Ethereum currency. So if they were to fluctuate, these would fluctuate as well. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I think. <laughs> Sorry, if we go back to the Rolex uh, watch. Let's say uh, Alice and Bob, I think. Alice yeah. owns the Rolex and wants to sell it to Bob. Yeah. They're having this discussion, just negotiating this selling the Rolex. Yeah, so you use Rolex. Okay. Can we feed in, in the block, can we feed in the, the negotiation that happened? You could. And turn yeah. it into a binding, legally binding. Of course. Like, that's so exciting because it's happening right now. The problem with the solution right now is scalability. So if you want to do exchanges very fast, it doesn't work. So for example, high volume trading or these like negotiation or auction systems doesn't work really well. So there's a new type of technology that's being created called off-chain uh, off technologies. The most famous one is the Lightning Network. It's based on top of Bitcoin, and there's Raven that's built on top of Ethereum. And what this basically is, is they use the blockchain as a settlement platform when you reach the, the, the agreed upon the price. So let's say I want to sell you my watch. Price and condition. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's say I want to sell you my watch. We start with an initial con uh, transaction that says, you know, "Okay, this is the watch. I'm able. I want to sell. It. I want to buy it. I want to buy it for at most eight hundred dollars. No one knows that, right? And the recipient and the, the, the seller says, "Okay, I want to sell it for at most seven hundred dollars." So they have these transactions on the chain. Now, off the chain, they take tokens that were created here, and they can start exchanging them really fast. And these updates, in a cryptographic way. I'm not going to go into the details. But they update in a really good way. And then when they reach a, a, an agreed upon point at the end, they just use the blockchain as a settlement platform. So we can have a new transaction that takes as input the output of these, so that it looks completely legit. You can make sure that uh, the, the, the initial, the entry conditions and the, out, the, the, out, the exit conditions are met, and both parties are happy. And uh, in case, uh, so the guy who received the transaction is done, we received the watch, but he's not happy about it. The condition doesn't match yeah. the discussion. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fear is like you can set a time lock onto uh, you can set a time lock in the future to invalidate the transaction. So if you do, I buy it, but I have 30 days to get it back to you. But like 30 days, uh, okay, good. And within 30 days, you can invalidate the transaction. Uh, what blockchain doesn't guarantee is you returning the item in the real world. But the money, yeah, that's okay. so it's offline chain, uh, chain, off chain, chain operations, off chain operations. So lightning is <laughs> the keyword. Yeah, uh, like a short term future. And yeah, within the next couple of years, then we'll have other problems there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions.